Good morning, everyone. So today uh, we'll come to the final chapter in this course, which is on durability uh, pertaining to alkali silica reaction in freezing and thawing. We've already discussed uh, some basics about uh, what type of aggregates are reactive under alkali silica reaction conditions. In the chapter on aggregates, we talked about how the geological origin dictates the mineralogy of the aggregate that leads it to be either reactive or unreactive in the alkaline environment and concrete. Uh, primarily, the reaction pertains to the reactive silica in the aggregate with the alkalis that are generated either from the cement or from the admixtures which are in the concrete. I also talked briefly earlier about certain types of carbonate aggregates which may have the propensity for engaging in a reaction with the alkalis that leads to the formation of uh, expansive products and finally the failure of concrete. So in this chapter, we'll touch upon the same subject again, uh, but look at it from the viewpoint of concrete performance rather than aggregate mineralogy, okay? That we have already talked about in some detail earlier and we'll also briefly talk about freezing and thawing. So th there are several issues related to aggregate and concrete. This is a slide that you've seen before in the aggregates chapter. There are physical mechanisms and chemical mechanisms that may deteriorate the aggregate which is present in the concrete. So there is incompatibility that the aggregates may exhibit like thermal or moisture related effects. There can be freezing and thawing which can affect the aggregate. Now for example, if I have a porous aggregate, water inside the aggregate can tend to freeze and that freezing can lead to an increase in the volume and subsequent thawing will lead to re again reduction in volume. So again, you have the freezing and thawing of the aggregate itself that can actually happen. And chemically, you have uh, certain types of aggregate that we have that may be prone to acid attack or alkali attack and mostly what we are interested in finding out is alkali aggregate reaction. There may be other instances of sulphate attack because of the kind of aggregates that we use. For example, when you use pyrite aggregate which has sulphide in it, it can oxidize to sulphuric acid and that may lead to acid attack of the concrete. Thomasite sulphate attack can also happen when you have carbonate based aggregates. We talked about this briefly when we discussed sulphate attack earlier. So let us talk about alkali aggregate reaction. Now, the first instance of somebody looking at alkali aggregate reaction was in the 1920s. It was discovered by accident actually, uh, when some of the dams that were being serviced by the US Army Corps of Engineers, that and those started showing signs of uh, damage. I'm sorry, not US Army Corps of Engineers, but US Bureau of Reclamation. USBR. So they are the authority which looks at the dams in the middle and western part of the United States and uh, they found that some of the dams were showing some irregular forms of cracking which looked quite similar to drying shrinkage cracking. But then they started investigating and then they found that the characteristics were quite different from drying shrinkage. And uh, there was a scientist named Stanton who did a lot of pioneering work on alkali silica reactivity in the 1940s. But although the work has started in 1940s, if you go to the US today also, alkali silica reaction is probably the most popular research topic and most researchers in the country are probably involved in research on alkali silica reactivity because there is still a lot of problems that have not been understood very clearly, uh, when you, especially when you have a combination of problems along with alkali silica reaction. So the deterioration of concrete is not easy to predict, testing methods need a lot of uh, refinement and you cannot always design very clearly the suitable test method to potentially assess the alkali silica reactivity of the materials. So it's still a hot topic of research. Uh, there's still a lot of problems around the world which are associated with ASR uh, and people are trying on a regular basis to solve these problems. So what is alkali silica reaction? It's just the reaction of alkalis in concrete with certain specific types of aggregate. Primarily we deal with ASR where reactive forms of silica are present. You can also get alkali carbonate reaction when carbonate aggregates, especially dolomitic aggregates, which have a lot of clay matter in them, those are the ones which are susceptible to alkali carbonate reaction, okay. And then alkali, the sources of alkalis are either from the cement, from the admixtures used, sometimes the water or the aggregates themselves may have alkalis which can ultimately lead to this reaction with the reactive materials present in the aggregate, okay. Now the reaction as such is quite simple. You have alkalis plus reactive silica along with moisture. Moisture is very essential because Without moisture, the gel that forms cannot expand. So the alkali silica reaction gel, which forms because of reaction between alkalis and reactive silica needs moisture to expand and this expansion leads to concrete cracking. Now this process is very slow. The process of uh, the reaction between alkalis and silica happens over several years and by the time you see a concrete 
which is subjected to ASR start cracking, it is already around 20, 25 years. Okay? So, most of these cracks will show up only after a period of 20, 25 years. So, that is why it is a lot more challenging to understand or predict whether the given concrete will be susceptible to such kind of cracking or not. So, these are some examples of uh, structures which have degraded because of alkali silica reaction. You can see that the cracking pattern looks quite similar to what you have at drying shrinkage. There is not much difference. Random cracking like drying shrinkage or thermal shrinkage, you get random cracks like this. But the only difference is if you notice very clearly inside the cracks, you will see some sort of a black or white product that is oozing out of the crack. Okay? That is the alkali silica reaction gel, ASR gel. It is usually a low viscosity gel. After expansion happens, this viscos uh, the viscosity is low enough for the gel to start oozing out of the crack. Originally, the gel is white in color, but after carbonation, that means after exposure to atmospheric carbon dioxide, the gel becomes black. So, that is how you will distinguish. Uh, see, this is an example of white gel and that is an example of a black gel. So, that is how you would be able to distinguish the cracking due to alkali silica reaction versus the cracking because of other forms of shrinkage like drying shrinkage or thermal shrinkage. Again, this is an example of uh, ASR in a dam. Mostly, a lot of the early signs of ASR were detected in dams okay? because what is one condition in dams which is not there in other structures? Okay. I mean, everywhere we want to use locally available aggregates, there is no doubt about that. Moisture, the availability of moisture. In a dam, water is always available right? and so the propensity for ASR damage to be high is very large in a dam and that is where the damage can lead to a lot more disaster especially in terms of water seeping in through the dams and that will probably further aggravate the problems because wa water seeping in through the dams may cause other, other issues also like leaching right? and uh, ultimately it may lead to complete failure of the dam itself. So, you can see this is a, a huge sign of alkali silica reaction that is happening here and this is an example of a bridge pier which is having alkali reactive aggregates and you can see the kind of damage that is happening. You can see the gel oozing out, yeah? major signs of the gel oozing out of the, uh, of the cracks. So, there are different forms of reactive silica, we have discussed this uh, briefly before. Uh, igneous rocks which are susceptible to ASR include rhyolite, andesite, dacite, pumice, obsidian, volcanic tuff and certain types of basalt. We are essentially talking about either extrusive igneous rocks or the pyroclastic igneous rocks. Okay? Those are the ones which have some signs of reactive silica. Intrusive rocks like granite cool down slowly, so there is a lot, very high degree of crystallinity. So, you do not really have the reactive silica present in intrusive igneous rocks. Sedimentary rocks, the, pri the primary ones which are subjected to this kind of a damage include chert, greywacky. They are usually found in a lot of river gravel. Okay, when river gravel is there, is used as aggregate, you will find a lot of signs of chert and greywacky in there. And sometimes, some sandstones can also have reactive tendencies, flint can have reactive tendencies. Metamorphic rocks which have this problem include gra nice, schist, phyllite, argillite and quartzite and we talked about this earlier that although metamorphic rocks are highly crystalline, the quartz present in the metamorphic rocks could be strained because of the high temperatures and pressures which are accompanying the formation of such rocks and that leads to reactivity from these silica particles. So, again this is a table once again which is repeated from the previous chapter. We have talked about this before, so I am not going to touch upon this again. So, there are different forms of reactive components which, which are present in the aggregate. We are primarily concerned with silica glass, opal and chalcedony. These are the main forms present in igneous and sedimentary rocks. When we talk about metamorphic rocks, it is usually quads which is present in the strained form that leads to reactivity in the material. So, just this is a schematic depiction of the process that actually accompanies ASR. So, when you have the aggregates in the alkaline solution, what happens is generally you have the amorphous silica, you can see the amorphous silica without any, without much order and then there, there are alkaline ions in the pore solution surrounding the aggregate and slowly what happens is uh, you have the surface of the aggregate which is attacked by OH minus and that leads to the formation of these silanol groups, silica plus OH minus, okay? that is the silanol group that is shown on the bottom right of this image. And then the silanol groups are, are broken down by OH minus into SiO minus. Okay, this is just steps in the reaction and then finally, the SiO minus attract the alkali cations because SiO is a negative charged ion. So, it attracts the alkali cations, sodium and potassium and it forms this gel around the aggregate. So, if you have to detect an 
early sign of alkali aggregate reaction, if you do microscopic studies of the concrete, the early sign would be that around the aggregates a small layer would be forming, okay. That is called the ASR gel layer. Now this gel has not really created any damage. It creates damage only when it starts taking in water and then it expands and creates damage, okay. So that is the next step, alkali silica gel takes in water expanding and exerting a force against the surrounding concrete and that force obviously leads to the cracking of the paste around the concrete first and these cracks eventually will go through the aggregate because the aggregate itself has been weakened, right. The surface of the aggregate has now been transformed into a gel. The aggregate itself is weak so the cracks will finally extend through the aggregate itself and these cracks ultimately reach the surface of the concrete and then show up as these irregular shaped cracks which are also known as map cracking. Map cracking generally means irregular shaped cracks on the surface of the concrete. So if you look microscopically, as I said, in the early sign of alkali silica reactivity, you will form this sort of a gel ring, okay. And then you see this crack that is emanating from this gel ring. Ultimately that crack can become quite large and spread all the way through the paste and probably even sometimes through the aggregate. Another picture of the ASR damage where there is tremendous amount of damage in the paste and the aggregate also has been completely cracked. Now these are different types of aggregates that are exposed to alkali silica reactivity. This is done by a standard test, okay, which is ASTM C227 test in which the mortars prepared with these potentially reactive aggregates and cement are stored at 38 degrees Celsius, just higher temperature to accelerate the process a little bit and then the expansions are noted against time, okay. This is a very common test done for ASR and in this case, you can see that certain types of aggregate exhibit a greater reactivity. For example, the quartzites are exhibiting much greater reactivity than the granite, okay. So again, the quartzites have the strain quartz kind of aggregate because of which they are more reactive as compared to the granites. Granites have highly crystalline quartz, so they do not really show much expansion. So the idea is that this 0.2 percent is generally taken as a very critical sort of an expansion period. If aggregates are crossing that 0.2 percent expansion, then they really have a danger of being called as highly reactive aggregate. Most of the other aggregates which are here are not really as reactive as the others which are showing up to 0.2 percent expansion. So now there is an interesting scenario as far as alkali aggregate reaction is concerned. The calcium content in the pore solution depends on the alkali concentration. So if your pore solution is rich in alkali, sodium and potassium positively charged species, so there will be less of calcium in the pore solution, right. We know this in an ordinary Portland cement system, the pore solution concentration is rich in sodium and potassium ions, so not much of the CaOH twice, calcium hydroxide pumps in the calcium into the solution because there is already a lot of positively charged species available, okay. In the case of a mineral admixture based concrete, right, you are diluting the cement, so the alkali concentration in the pore solution is now lowered. So there is going to be more calcium present in the pore solution, okay, more calcium will be available. So the ratio of calcium to the alkalis in the gel determines the expansive pressure. Usually the higher the calcium content, the lesser will be the expansive pressure of the gel. So already there is one positive sign of using supplementary cementing materials. When you use SCMs, you bring up the calcium concentration in the gel that leads to a lowered expansion because you do not have as much alkaline ions in the pore solution. So if the alkali hydroxide concentration falls below 0.3 normal, the reaction tends to slow down and stop. So that is why we talked about this earlier that when you have special cements like low alkali cements, you can lead to complete elimination of the alkali silica reaction, okay. But low alkali cements are not really preferred, why? So we need high early strengths from concrete. So generally we tend to work with cements that have high alkali contents. So if you are pushing down the alkali content too much, we are affecting the early age strength gain of the concrete. So the, generally we would not prefer low alkali cements. But if you have to have very high resistance to alkali silica reactivity already built in, using a low alkali cement definitely would help. But again, we can also cut down the alkali concentration by substituting the cement with supplementary cementing materials. Now incidentally, the amount of reactive aggregate that you have in your system and the size of that aggregate can also have some sort of an different kind of a relationship as far as its relation to the expansion is concerned. So if you plot the ASR expansion against the percentage of reactive aggregate, for most aggregates you will get 
and co a constantly increasing tendency. That means as you increase the amount of reactive aggregate in your system. So for example, if you had a choice that you could replace some of your locally available reactive aggregate with another non-reactive aggregate, if you look at that kind of a relationship, if you have with some reactive aggregates, the more the amount of reactive aggregate, the more the expansion. That is only logical, right? But in certain other types of aggregate, you reach some sort of a pessimum condition. That means if you have certain amount of reactive aggregate, you lead to a high level of expansion. But if you have too much of the aggregate, you tend to lower the expansion. Now, why do you think this is actually happening? If you have a lot of reactive aggregate, why, why is your expansion actually coming down? Your alkalis are getting more and more distributed across the system. Whereas in the other case, when you had a certain lesser number of reactive aggregate, your alkalis are now concentrated around certain aggregates which are able to produce significant quantities of the alkali silica gel that leads to expansion. Okay. Similarly, if you use a very small sized aggregate, if you really think about it, your uh, mineral admixtures which are rich in reactive silica can be thought about as very minute sized reactive aggregate. But in that case, we do not see expansions. Why? The surface area is extremely high, the alkali content is not large enough to really create the kind of gel formation which you need for expansion. And further, I will talk about that later, the unreacted glassy structure of the silica that is present in the pozzolanic materials is able to trap the alkalis and prevents its association with the silica to form the gel. Okay. So again, there is a lot of advantages of using SEMs in the alkali silica reactivity. You are first of all preventing the alkalis from reaching the reactive silica and secondly, the high surface area of the pozzolanic particles prevents the alkali from engaging in a reaction that forms gel similar to what you form with aggregates. Okay. So, if you have a certain size of the aggregate, the expansion can be maximum. And that pessimum expansion typically happens. Pessimum is just the opposite of optimum. Okay. If this was a positive property, we would have called this optimum. Since ASR expansion is a negative characteristic, we call it pessimum. So, this size that is most crucial is typically between 2, 2 mm to 8 mm. Around that size is the pessimum expansion. You see a lot of expansion possible from the aggregate around that size. So, primarily we are looking at the smaller end of the coarse aggregate or we are looking at the middle and higher end of the fine aggregate for reactive tendencies. Okay. So, if you are using river sand, mostly you do not really have a problem of ASR, but if you are using crushed sand made out of these rocks, then there is a high possibility that ASR could be there. Okay. So, that pessimum size is around sand size. Okay. If you are going much higher than that, your level of expansion will start coming down. Why? Once again, relative to the surface area that is available for reactivity, the volume of the aggregate is rather large. So, you do not really create that level of gel that can create a very high expansion in your system. Okay. So, when you are trying to increase the surface area, oh sorry, trying to increase the size, the surface area to volume ratio is going down. Right? So, because of that, you do not really have the quantity of gel required to create a lot of expansion. The alkali content also sometimes shows this kind of a relationship that if you have too high an alkali content, if you go too, too much higher, then the reaction or reactivity is so fast that it happens very early in the life cycle. And again, with very small size of, uh, sizes of aggregate or with pozzolanic materials, this binding of the alkali happens very early in the life cycle. That does not lead to any major expansions in the later ages. Okay. So, you need to understand that you can get different scenarios with different types of aggregate. So, testing is all the more important as far as ASR is concerned. You need to be aware of what all scenarios are possible in the future. Now, of course, as I was saying, there is nearly 80 to 90 years of research that is already, already available with ASR. So, most of these things are well looked at and uh, people have actually even done a classification of different types of aggregate uh, based on their tendencies to show such behavior. Okay. So, again as I said ASR is very slow, it takes many years to show. Irregular cracks appear on the surface and gel sometimes is oozing out of this crack. It can transform to black on carbonation and linear expansion sometimes can be as high as 80 percent. If you are measuring this on prismatic specimens for which you measure the length, the expansion could be sometimes as high as 80 percent 
provided the specimen is not cracking before you reach that level of expansion. So, how do you protect against CSR? First and foremost is to use a low alkali cement, but that is usually not a possibility these days because we want a high early strength. Preventing access of moisture sometimes by using coatings can really help, okay. That is shown to be a very positive way of reducing the amount of expansion that happens due to ASR. Use of chemical admixtures with lithium. Now, lithium is a lot more active as compared to sodium or potassium and can bind your aggregates which have reactive silica into a non-expansive product. So, lithium is also an alkali, but it forms a non-reactive product with the aggregate. But these lithium is also extremely expensive. So, the most popular technique of swapping ASR is to use mineral admixtures, silica fume, fly ash or slag. They can first of all reduce the penetration of moisture because of lower permeability, right. And secondly, you are increasing the calcium concentration in the pore solution by binding the alkalis or by diluting the cement. So, already alkali contents are low in the system. So, ASR expansions are extremely limited when you have cement substituted by mineral admixtures. So, most mineral additives will show you a highly positive result whenever they are used as substitutes for cement. The challenge is in the testing for ASR. Now, we already talked about the fact that this problem takes many years to manifest. So, a real life assessment of ASR to create that with an accelerated test in the lab is extremely difficult, right. So, for a long time, people have been using this test method called ASTM C227, where cement mortar is prepared with the expansive aggregate. So, the expansive coarse aggregate is now crushed to sand size. As I said, sand size is the pessimum. That means, it creates the most expansion. So, you crush it to sand size and we use a high alkali cement for this test, okay, and store it at 38 degrees under moist conditions, 100 percent RH. And th we measure the length change with respect to time. This usually takes, the test usually takes at least 6 months to a year to produce any kind of result because again, you are not really accelerating the process tremendously. You are only still working with the regular aggregate with high alkali cement. So, it takes as much time as it would in a regular scenario. Only thing is you are accelerating by increasing the temperature of storage. So, because of that you may have slight reactivity increase because of which you can get faster expansions, okay. Now, there is no clear cut understanding of what is the critical length at what age that needs to be crossed for the ag aggregate to be deemed as potentially deleterious. As I was saying earlier that 0.2 percent is a useful guideline to choose for this kind of a test, okay. Now, realizing the need for a faster test, the, uh, the research, research community came out with another test method called ASTM C1260. Here cement mortars are prepared with ordinary cement. You do not need to choose a high alkali cement and the reactive aggregate which is again crushed to sand size, but this is now stored at 80 degrees Celsius and not in water, but in a high concentration sodium hydroxide solution. In other words, instead of having an internal source of alkali like in ASTM C227, we now have an external source of alkali which at the high temperature will penetrate much faster and will react much faster with the reactive aggregate. And this result can be obtained within 2 weeks. Okay, and here it clearly says that when the expansion is greater than 0.2 percent, it is a reactive aggregate. Less than 0.1 percent, it is a non-reactive aggregate. And between 0.1 and 0.2, it may have some late reactivity in the system. The only problem is this does not seem to work for the kind of aggregates that have the reactive quads, the strained quads type reactive aggregate do not show any expansion this in this reaction. Okay. So, you can potentially have a test that does not indicate reactivity, but in the long run you may actually have some reactivity in the system. So, you have to use tests suitably to understand which is reactive, which is not. ASTM C289, here you simply grind the aggregate and immerse it in sodium hydroxide solution. When you grind the aggregate, you are exposing the silica to the reaction with the alkali and you simply measure the amount of dissolved silica in the system. So, that tells you how much of the silica is reacting in the alkaline solution, how much is still remaining in the aggregate and how much is reacting in the alkaline solution. So, that tells you a measure of how reactive your aggregate is. Now, the problem is none of these tests are simulating the actual concrete. Okay. Here, we are breaking the aggregate into smaller sizes, increasing reactivity and so on, but the real concrete you are not really testing with this. 
So people are also trying to come out with concrete prism tests where they are actually producing the same concrete that will be used in the site and subjecting that to real life conditions and trying to assess the alkali silica, silica reactivity. But once again people would tend to use the tests that are giving them the fastest results that is why this ASTM C1260 is still the most preferred test method. For silic silica glass type aggregate or opal or chalcedony containing aggregate this test method can give you a very quick indication of the result but it does not seem to work with the aggregates that have reactive quads. You can also do finally a petrographic evaluation microstructural or microscopic evaluation of the aggregate usually you should do it in conjunction with any other type of test to un understand what is the potential of the aggregates to determine to show this kind of reactivity. Now alkali carbonate reaction happens when some types of carbonate rocks are used primarily dolomitic rocks and again when you have very fine crystals in the dolomite which have clay as an inclusion they are the ones which are highly susceptible to alkali carbonate reaction. The reaction is a lot more complicated as opposed to alkali silica reaction because the kind of possibilities that exist here are tremendous. You can have alkali hydroxides that react with dolomite and strip it off magnesium and lead to the formation of magnesium hydroxide which we saw earlier was forming in the case of magnesium sulphate attack right. But this magnesium hydroxide formation sometimes apparently is expansive just like what you have in your unsoundness test for cement right. When you have lot of magnesium oxide present in your cement it leads to the conversion to magnesium hydroxide upon hydration and that may lead to some unsoundness in your cement. The same kind of scenario is envisaged for damage as far as alkali carbonate reaction is concerned. But so it is not something which you see on a regular basis so we would not really come across too many instances of, instances of such reactions happening okay. But nevertheless this has been detected and this could be one of the possibilities affecting concrete structures wherever carbonate rocks are used as aggregate okay. So let us briefly talk about freezing and thawing which is more of a physical problem there are no chemical reactions involved in this case here we are simply talking about conversion of water to ice and back to water. So freezing happens when water converts to ice and thawing is the reverse process of ice converting to water. So water converting to ice leads to expansion and then thawing leads to again reduction in the volume so you have heaving and contraction of the concrete that leads to cracking in the concrete. There can be three types of failure that can happen failure in the paste, failure in the aggregate which is called decracking or failure in the aggregate that results in pop out of the aggregate. The aggregate simply comes out of the concrete because of freezing. Okay, Let us look at these problems in more detail. So failure of the paste happens primarily because water within the paste tends to convert to ice okay. And you know very well that in a concrete the first part to get frozen will be the part that is in contact with the atmosphere because that is how the cold will set into the concrete okay. And this cold front will slowly move through the concrete converting the water inside the concrete to ice. So when the water starts converting to ice there is a volume expansion. So in a pore if you consider there is water which starts transforming to ice when it starts transforming to ice because of volume expansion it will start pushing the water through the pore. So this water tends to start traveling through the constricted spaces of the capillary pore. So that travel of water through the small spaces of capillary pore generates the kind of pressures that le leads to cracking. It is not the formation of ice that is causing cracking it is the resultant movement of water because of formation of ice that really ends up in causing cracking. Now in paste failure you can also experience sometimes scaling of the surface, scaling of the top surface. So near the top surface where freezing is very high you can actually get local damage much faster than the damage actually reaches the inner layers. So scaling or removal of the top surface of the concrete can happen very quickly in the case of a freezing type of a reaction and that can be worsened when de-icing salts are used. You know very well in colder countries to prevent the icing up of the surface during winters they spray salt on the surface. So what does salt do? Why is salt sprayed on the surface? It lowers the freezing point of the water. Salt lowers the freezing point because of which the water on the surface does not convert to ice very fast. So salt like magnesium chloride or sodium chloride, calcium chloride sometimes is sprayed on the road surfaces so that the vehicles can move without any problems. 
they also sometimes put sand so that the sand can break the water and then you can get good friction on the roads, not create slipping from the roads, right. But these salts, because a high concentration exists on the road surface, these salts will try to then penetrate, right. And that penetration or osmotic pressure because of penetration of the salts, right, that can add to this scaling problem and create a lot of damage on the road surface. Of course, we are talking about concrete roads and where is concrete found in roads? Primarily in bridge decks, okay. When you have bridge sections or over crossing sections, you have concrete segments and these concrete segments are, are where you will see the maximum damage as far as freezing and thawing combined with de-icer salt scaling is concerned. So, when de-icing salts are used, it is called de-icer salt scaling. And uh, incidentally, the de-icing salts can ultimately end up causing damage to parking lots also. And this was something that people were really concerned with, how are parking lots getting damaged because of freezing and thawing. Most parking lots do not really have any moisture. So, what they later found out was the cars that are travelling through the roads which have the de-icing salts, right, because the tyres are taking in some of these salts along with the ice these cars that are passing through these roads come and finally park in the parking lot. With time the salts with the water start dripping onto the surface of the parking lot, right. And again by osmosis the salts are penetrating the surface of the concrete. So, you are actually getting scaling and damage to parking lots causing caused because of the ice and water and the salt that is carried by the vehicles that go and park in the parking lot. So, they saw a lot of damage happening to the parking lots because of in winter primarily because of the de salts that were carried by the vehicles. Now, decracking relates to the failure of the paste when it is subjected to expansive stresses created by the aggregate. So, the paste failure happens when the paste itself has freezing happening inside. Now, de salts uh, sorry decracking is the name given to the shape of the crack that appears when the aggregate creates cracking in the paste. Now, why is this happening? So, primarily it is seen in pavements. So, supposing this is your pavement with the pavement slab, this is the direction of movement of the traffic whichever way, it is the longitudinal direction in, in the direction of the movement of the traffic and this is the transverse direction here. So, these are the joints between the highway pavement slabs and you know the joints are particularly susceptible to penetration of moisture. So, the moisture that penetrates through the joints when specific types of aggregates are used, the aggregates can actually absorb this moisture and in cold conditions the moisture turns to ice. So, aggregate starts expanding and when aggregate expands, it creates cracking in the paste. And when this cracking shows up on the road surface, it resembles this D type pattern. Of course, you can call it O type pattern also, it is just a relative way of looking at things. But before somebody could say that is an O, people said that is a D. <laughs> so, that is why it is called D cracking, okay. So, pattern resembles the letter D if you draw this vertical line, there is no crack here you need to draw that vertical line. So, technically it is better to call it an O crack. Anyway, so they call it a D cracking, this is actually failure of the paste because of expansion of the aggregate. And pop out happens when you have aggregates near the surface of the pavement and these aggregates which are expanding simply pop out of the road surface. This is a common phenomenon in sidewalks in the western countries wherever freezing is a problem. So, the aggregates that expand cannot sustain that pressure anymore, they are very close to the surface of the concrete and instead of cracking the concrete, they simply pop out, okay. And sometimes when they pop out, they also can take away a chunk of mortar surrounding the aggregate. So, what is the mechanism? As I said again, the volume expansion due to water converting to ice tends to push the water through the constricted capillary porosity. But before that, you need to understand that the freezing of water will not happen very easily inside concrete because concrete has capillary pores that are extremely small. So, when the diameter of the capillary pores reduces, there is also a very high pressure inside the capillaries. So, when high pressure conditions exist, you cannot really cause freezing of water at 0 degree Celsius. Typically, in very minute pores, sometimes water will not freeze until you reach minus 40 Celsius, okay. So, freezing conditions in inside concrete may not actually occur until you reach temperatures of minus 20, minus 15, minus 30 like that. That is why freezing and thawing is not really a problem 
if your temperatures are only coming close to about 0 or minus 2 or minus 5 degrees Celsius. Freezing and thawing really becomes a problem only when your temperatures are touching as low as minus 15, minus 20 because only at those temperatures the water inside concrete will freeze. And please remember the water inside concrete is not plain water, it is a poor solution, it contains alkali ions. So what is the presence of ionic species going to do to the water? Again ionic species will depress the freezing point. So water is held in capillary pressure, water is having ionic species, so the freezing point of water inside concrete is depressed. That means you cannot cause freezing until you reach very low temperatures. Okay. So once you reach that temperature, you can cause freezing of this water and once the temperature comes back to more than 0, this water will again transform to, uh, sorry, ice will transform again to water. So wherever you get cycles of freezing and thawing, this damage can be quite substantial. If you have a single conversion of water to ice and it remains like that for a number of days or possibly even years, the condition which we call as permafrost, permanent frozen condition. In those cases, you do not expect much damage to happen to the concrete. But when you have cycles of freezing and thawing happening on a regular basis, that is when the damage to be, uh, can be quite extensive. And because of that, the test method that is done for this to simulate this condition in the lab, also look at concrete prismatic specimens that are stored inside these ice boxes where freezing happens uh, from the, the temperature starts at 5 degrees Celsius and it is taken down to minus 20. It is cycled between 5 and minus 20 for 300 cycles and every 100 cycles you take your prismatic specimen out and measure some property of it, typically a dynamic property. You apply either a pulse velocity or a resonant frequency to determine the dynamic modulus of the concrete and look at the change in the dynamic modulus as you subject it to more and more cycles of freezing and thawing. Okay. So essentially the paste failure is happening primarily because of the ice creating in the pore and water starting to flow out of the ice, uh, flow out of the pore. So which is why when you have this air void located at regular intervals, the length of flow of water the amount which with uh, the, the length that the water actually has to cover will reduce. If you have more and more air voids in between, the water needs to travel only a small distance before which it can find an air void where it can settle. And then air void gives enough space for the water to convert to ice, so there is no problem of conversion, there is no problem of expansion, okay. which is why we discussed earlier that we need to have a critical distance maintained between the air voids that critical distance is 0 0.2 millimeter or 200 micrometer. Okay. So air voids inside concrete should be present within a spacing of 0 0.2 millimeters. So that means any water molecule which is present in between two air voids does not have to travel more than 0 0.1 millimeter inside the constricted capillary pore. Okay. Again these calculations have been done assuming certain size of capillaries which generates a certain pressure and based on generation of that pressure, the travel across a distance of more than 0.1 millimeter may generate hydraulic pressures that are large enough to cause cracking in the concrete. So a lot of assumptions are there, you are assuming a certain tensile stress for the concrete, you are assuming a certain ca capillary pore size. Okay. So based on that, people have worked out that the air void should be at least or not more than 200 microns apart to minimize the length of travel of the water inside these capillary pores. So salt scaling happens when you have salts which are sprayed on the surface in winters to reduce the freezing point of water and with the osmotic pressure exerted when the salts try to penetrate the concrete, you can add that to the capillary pressures because of freezing and that leads to ex excessive damage on the, on the surface of the pavement. So salt scaling is a realistic problem, it can deteriorate your pavement significantly. Now see again, please remember when you are reducing water cement ratio, you are reducing porosity, you are also reducing your capillary pores. And please uh, when we discussed this uh, effect of water cement ratio on the pore size, we saw that the pore sizes were also becoming much finer. So when your water cement ratio is lowered, your pore sizes are becoming much finer. So you are going to further depress your freezing point. Okay. So freezing inside concrete with very low water cement ratio will not happen that easily. So generally lowering water cement ratio is a positive factor to contribute to improving the characteristic against freezing and thawing.
Okay. So, using high performance concrete will generally tend to improve the condition of your concrete against freezing and thawing. So, protection of course is offered by using air entraining agents and using very low water to cement ratio concrete as far as freezing and thawing is concerned. But of course, this is just showing you a microscopic image of ice forming inside, ice crystals forming inside a large void. So, this is the void here and the ice is forming on the surface of the void particles. For aggregate, the primary cause of failure is because of moderate level of porosity existing within the aggregate or certain types of aggregate like uh, very porous aggregate which are on the surface of the concrete can expand and pop out. So, moderately porous and very porous aggregate need to be avoided from your concrete. Now, generally what you, when you use quarried aggregate, you know exactly what type of aggregate is being used and you know very well what the levels of porosity will be. When you use riverbed gravel, you get a mixture of different types of rocks in the river gravel and you need to be sure that the, the entire set of rock that you are using from river gravel, the amount of aggregate which has low or moderate porosity is less. And again, if you look at your aggregate standards like ASTM C33 or IS383, it clearly tells you that the amount of low density material that you have in the aggregate should be less than 5 percent of your aggregate sample. This is not a problem when you are using quarried aggregate because mostly the aggregate is of the same time, but in river gravel this becomes a concern. So, there is actually a method of megascopic evaluation of aggregate where you take a certain number of pieces of the aggregate and look at it megascopically and also determine the aggregate pieces which are not belonging to that group and then you try to then further characterize that type of aggregate. One common tendency is to find aggregates like chert whenever you have river gravel okay, along with limestone. Uh, which is commonly found in river gravel, you can also find chert and the amount of chert that you have in the system should be restricted to less than 5 percent. Okay. So, with that we come to the end of this chapter and also to the end of the course. So, uh, over the 14 weeks that we have had, we have looked at various different characteristics of concrete. Uh, primarily, we have looked at uh, how cement chemistry dictates many of the durability related problems in concrete and the impact that we wanted to give towards the end when we discussed different durability chapters was that the cement chemistry has a large role to play in dictating the mechanical and durability properties of concrete. So, long term properties also dictated by how the cementitious materials react with water and the kind of microstructure that develops in the early stages of cement hydration. So, you see now the link between the different processes and the role that cement chemistry has to play in dictating the qualities, long term qualities of the concrete. So, thank you all very much.